The agreement by the governments of the United Kingdom and China will, I trust, be an encouragement to you. You have been promised in that agreement that the institutions, traditions, and way of life so important to the people of Hong Kong will be preserved. The Royal Yacht Britannia has the beautifully clean lines that look good in any harbour, but there are three places in the world where the combination of yacht and harbour are perfect. Venice is one, Sydney another, and Hong Kong the third. And this was one of the better arrivals. Fine weather, fine precision, and all done without the benefit of a rehearsal. single hand signal and the anchor was dropped and Britannia dressed overall. Her escort, the destroyer HMS York, passed to starboard, her crew lining the decks at attention. The Navy still has a considerable talent for this sort of thing. There was a rather motley fly-past. Hong Kong is not into air forces, preferring commercial airlines and their profits. The Royal Barge crossed the quarter of a mile of water towards Queen's Pier. The crowds were big enough, but corralled at a distance. For the Queen, two things are different from her last visit 11 years ago. The population is larger by a million people, and all of them are living with the reality of being handed over to China 11 years from now. Her job was to reassure them, as best she could, that Britain has an abiding interest in their future. That future, in 11 years' time, and its uncertainty, was underlined by the Gurkha Guard of Honour. Hong Kong is the main base of the British Army's Gurkha battalions. In 1997, all that must end. Britain doesn't have too long to find a solution to this and a lot of other difficulties. It was therefore by design that at the very outset of the visit, the Queen went to the City Hall to meet the people who run Hong Kong and start the process of reassurance. Prince Philip and I come to Hong Kong after an historic visit to the People's Republic of China. That visit, the first by any British sovereign, symbolized the new relationship between Britain and China, a relationship in which the agreement between the two countries on the future of Hong Kong has played a significant part. You have been promised in that agreement that the institutions, traditions, and way of life so important to the people of Hong Kong will be preserved. The agreement and the firm commitment by the governments of the United Kingdom and China enshrined in it will, I trust, be an assurance and an encouragement to you as you face the challenges of the future. They took her to see their latest treasure, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, all 47 floors of it, costing 5,000 million pounds. It's the world's most expensive office building, all steel, all prefabricated, and put together on site. From just the 35th floor, the Queen could get an unrivaled view of the waterfront skyline, the excitement of this extraordinary city. 
There's such a fever of building here at the moment, perhaps precipitated by the Chinese takeover, that you could come back in six months and the skyline would be different again. Today, Hong Kong people have their own description of their passion and their ambition. They call it money culture. Government House crouches old and small beneath the palaces of money culture, but it's still the seat of administrative power, the place where the agreement with the mainland Chinese was worked out. The man primarily responsible for the agreement is Sir Edward Yude, the governor who's 62. He will also have to look after various possible revisions of the agreement in the next few years. He's an old China hand and was ambassador to Peking. He's fairly optimistic. The whole basis of the agreement is that the two should not mix here. The uh, agreement provides that the socialist system, which is in operation in China, will not be in operation in Hong Kong. And the agreement is very specific about the capitalist system, uh, the free market system, uh, the free access to the rest of the world for trade, uh, no exchange controls. All that is in an international agreement uh, which is valid for 50 years. You can see free trade and the lack of exchange controls at work in Hong Kong's container port. In volume of traffic, it's now the world's third largest. Local businessmen are pretty realistic about their future prospects. I suppose if you ask us uh, deep in our hearts that I suppose, uh, you know, we believe Hong Kong should be part of China. But of course, everyone is selfish, you know, thinking about his own benefits and standard of living. So, you know, we would like to live in a system in which we can continue, you know, to make money. We don't really care, you know, which administration is really under. Across the harbour on the Kowloon side, the Gurkha Pipe Band welcomed the Queen on a warm and humid evening as the barge brought her from Britannia. Actually, it was just the sort of evening for a ride in the old Rolls Landor with the hood back. The destination was the Colosseum Theatre, where they were to stage a spectacular by the children of the territory, designed to show Hong Kong's youth and vigour. The underlying point of the evening was that the performers will, in the next decade, become the people who will have to deal with their new communist masters. All their youth and vigour, and maybe something more, will be required.
Where Hong Kong ends and China begins, there is the continuing problem of illegal immigrants, IIs, the British Army calls them, people who try to cross the border to find work in the paradise they believe Hong Kong to be. Since Hong Kong already has the highest population density in all Asia and currently doesn't want to upset relations with China, it's the Army's job to catch the IIs and send them back. They've evolved a fairly elaborate and effective system of night patrols along the border. Action begins when the green light changes to red. Right, quickly, let's send 22 Charlie to check zone 39 and 23 Delta to zone 46 now. Hello, 22 Charlie, this is Zero. Check zone 39, 23 Delta, check zone 46. Out. The search unit sets off with a tracker dog. One man. Yeah. Yeah. Progress is followed using a night sight camera. It's difficult country for the search unit. There are plenty of good places to hide for the illegal immigrants. But doing this sort of thing seven nights a week teaches the troops where to look. On this occasion, in fairly quick time, they brought in three prisoners, the incident recorded on the black and white night sight camera. There was a boy on his own, followed by a couple. Each one had hands tied to prevent escape, but the treatment was gentle enough. The boy shivered from cold rather than fear. It turned out to be his third attempt. They were searched, but had few possessions. They hoped that the new life in Hong Kong would provide everything. But this time, it was not to be. The interrogation has become a pretty routine affair, if only because the story of escaping to a better life is always the same. But this time, there was talk of an amnesty for the Queen's visit. Where did you hear these rumours that the Queen will give Ai Ai's amnesty when they get to Hong Kong? The people in Poland told him that there's Queen's visit, and it would be more easier to obtain the article in Hong Kong in this period. I'm afraid it is untrue. You will not get an ID card. The procedure with the illegal immigrants varies little. A night in the cooler, then the depressing ride back across the border. It's interesting that the Chinese handle them with comparative gentleness when they get back. They have to pay a fine, but are rarely sent to corrective detention. Just this side of the border, the Hong Kong government has built its city of the future, a stark townscape of tower blocks fingering the sky. With a huge population and so little land, it is of course the only way to build, but it's a pretty chilling thing nonetheless. The Queen visited a ground floor flat. This is a two-bedroom flat. This is where your son lives. This is for the Did you care for a cup of tea, she said? Well, it's very kind, but I have a feeling, I think I have a very busy program, I'm afraid. It's very kind of you. Oh, yeah. The son of the family gave her a bouquet. Then, being a boy of some ingenuity, asked for her autograph, something she rarely gives. He asked for uh, um, your honor of your signature on the commemorative book. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> Put it to things on the front. There? Yes. Thank you, Your Majesty. And that's how the Queen's signature came to a tower block flat in the new town of Sha Tin. Then, in the new shopping precinct, they switched on the musical fountain for her.
High Rise Hong Kong manages to find room for two race courses. Mind you, if it didn't, most of the population would emigrate, such is the passion for gambling. Here at Happy Valley, it's the betting, not the love of the sport, that motivates the punters. Last season, they gambled over 2,000 million pounds, more than the value of Hong Kong's exports to Britain, Germany and Japan put together. It's a bit of an odd life for the horses. Their exercise yards tend to be the rooftops of the apartment blocks around the course, but they're just as pampered as any other racehorses, and the system works. Provided, of course, you're not living in the flat immediately below. The betting shops handle four million tickets each race day. Every transaction is computerized, but half a million people here have telephone accounts connected to the 7,000 computer terminals operated by the Royal Hong Kong Jockey Club. In the basement of Hong Kong's other course, Sha Tin, there are 1,600 of these terminals, rowed in banks of 100 at a time. They're never idle, for a single good race can bring in over five million pounds in bets. The government takes 10%. The government is therefore very happy. It was to Sha Tin course that the Queen came for her afternoon's racing, the Rolls Landor bowling over the lush grass. A few in the capacity 72,000 crowd had actually come to see her. But most of the punters went on punting adding in the space of that short drive down the course three million Hong Kong dollars to the tally for the second race. This day was the Queen's treat in a tour that had a lot of highlights but not too many treats. So she was happy to be on the familiar turf of a paddock discussing prospects with owners and trainers. For her, it was the love of the sport, not the money culture, that was appealing. Meantime, the betting board registered five and a half million pounds for the big race, the Queen Elizabeth Cup. Actually, it was a bad one for the punters. An outsider steamed past the favourites and excited the Chinese commentator. So a 14 to 1 shot occupied the rather functional winner's enclosure. The Queen presented the splendid cap and then initiated a small pantomime of ownership. the jockey got his reward and returned the compliment by presenting a bouquet. Now that's something she wouldn't see at home. The Duke, appropriately enough, is Colonel-in-Chief of the Duke of Edinburgh's own Gurkha Rifles and they paraded for him at their Hong Kong barracks. He inspected them in a relaxed, rather family sort of way. Afterwards, he met the men and their families and greeted some of them with the namaste, the Gurkha gesture of welcome. When he left, they garlanded him. And the whole battalion streamed behind the Land Rover, shouting and cheering. A proper way to say goodbye to the Colonel.
That last night, they blew £160,000 in 25 minutes on a firework display. There wasn't a word of dissent, even from the people of the money culture. For the Queen, this was the end of the visit to Hong Kong. She came out to say her farewells. Her Royal Marine Band marched in salute towards the flags. She waved for the last time. She will almost certainly not come here again before the Union flag is lowered forever on this crown colony, this remarkable territory that is called Hong Kong. <laughs>